Well, before we get started, I do have to apologize. Um, in the last lesson, we were talking about finances, and I got a little bit lost in my uh, brain fart. Um, I, I, I called uh, a certain type of investment a CDC, which is actual actually the uh, Center for Disease Control. Um, and then I and then I said I thought it was a CD, and so let me clarify here. Um, I am talking about a CD. Um, that, that's what it's called. Um, it, it's basically somewhere where you put your money and uh, you can't touch it for a number of years, but the interest rate is is not high enough to compete with, usually, to compete with, um, uh, uh, you see, over time, money becomes less valuable, generally speaking. Um, and interest rates that pay you for having money are oftentimes below that amount. So let me say it in a different way. Um, let's say you have a savings account with a 0.1% interest rate. And let's say that money loses its price at 6% every year. Okay, you obviously see your 5% off from even making ends meet. So then to make a profit off of that investment, it would have to be an excess of 7 or 8% just to, just to make some somewhat of a profit. So when you invest in a CD, they'll give you a really low interest rate. Um, and you won't be able to touch it. So it's actually worse than a savings account because you still have a bad interest rate. It's better than a savings account, but it's still not good enough to um, to rise in price at the same money, the same um, same rate that your money is becoming less valuable. Um, so just something to think over there. Um, sorry, I wasn't very clear on that. I, I do have brain farts occasionally while I'm teaching. There's a lot of different stuff in these lessons, and I, and I think that sometimes I I get a little bit um, off topic and lose sight of what I'm saying. So in today's lesson, we'll be talking about the function of the church. Um, and it seems like sometimes um, Christians kind of get together and, and we do church. We have our we have our rituals, but we really don't aren't we really don't know what the purpose is of the church. We go on Sundays, we do our things. Sometimes we have Wednesday night services or something like that, where our youth you know have their youth group meeting and all that. Um, and and that's kind of it. You know, we play church in a, in a, in a, in a sense. Um, the pastor is only there to um, reaffirm what we already know. He's not there to challenge our beliefs. He's not there to guide us. He's not there to equip us for ministry. He's there simply for our entertainment. I mean, think about the way that you get offended at your pastor. Um, it's 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 usually for oh well, he didn't wear a tie on Sunday, or or he didn't wear a suit, or or, or he didn't say this just right, or he didn't do this just right, or um, you know. The pastor was never meant to be the center stage um, that, that we need to give him all the attention. He was simply meant to be a shepherd for us. Um, I mean, goodness sakes, Jesus, you know, sent out the 72. He didn't go in place of the 72, right? And then the Gospels, remember that? Um, he equipped the disciples, the 12, to be able to start the church. And then they did. They, they did. Jesus didn't start the church. He laid the foundation, but then the 12 that he equipped, they went out and did that. See, but in today's American culture, it's very easy to get the idea that the pastor is just there for our own entertainment. He has to do things the way we want. He has to say things the way we want. He has to dress the way we want. He has to do everything exactly how we want. And I think that in all this, we lose the purpose of the church. We're so used to having all the right programs that we forget why do we need to have the programs. Um, and I'm not saying anything against church ministries. I think that they're very needed, but I think sometimes that we forget what the church is and what it's about. And that's what this lesson's about, the function <clears throat> of the church. Okay, so first off, the structure, let's talk about the structure of the church, that it is one body with one purpose, okay? One body with one purpose. Um you know, I think that the Reformation caused a lot of bad. Now, we have this idea that we can't work with any other churches. It doesn't even matter if we're Protestant or not. You have Catholics being, not Catholics, you have Baptists being upset with Pentecostals and Pentecostals being upset with Methodists. I mean, goodness sakes, it's just, there's so much disunity. And all our community is seeing 
is churches who can't even get along with each other. Why should I be a part of that? And I think that in doing this, we're, we're making a, a, um, a broken Christ, if you will. Um, I think that the church was meant to be one in focus and, and, and goal and, and trying to get people saved and trying to build God's kingdom in, in that... Now, I'm, I'm not trying to say that all churches preach salvation through Christ. I'm not trying to say that. Some preach salvation through works and that kind of stuff. But I think that sometimes we lose fact of the sight that we're all supposed to be working towards God's purposes, not our own. And we've allowed small disagreements to break our unity. For instance, this person thinks that the Lord's Supper is... is you know, that it, it literally turns into Christ's body. This person thinks it's only to be for a memorial. This person thinks that it's, you know, um, it, it gives special grace of some kind. It, all these different views, and yet all three of the people are doing the exact same thing. They're partaking of the Lord's Supper. They're just having different views of what it is for. But they're all obeying Christ's command, right? See what I mean? Like, Sometimes we make big deals out of little deals because we don't know what the church is actually about. Now, I'm not saying, once again, that we should budge on the important things. How are you saved? By faith through Jesus Christ. What is the evidence of true faith? Works. James talks about that. That's just, you know, you can't truly believe something and then just resign yourself to apathy. That just doesn't happen in the real world. Um... But, but with that being said, the, wor the works don't save you. They're just um, the fulfillment or the natural conclusion, if you will, of the faith. Okay? So, the church, what is the church? The church is the congregation. It's, it's a congregation. They're also called the saints, the body of Christ. Um, it, this is you if you are saved. Um, there is no one greater in God's kingdom. There's no one not so great in God's kingdom. We are all equal. Now, we all have different responsibilities that I think needs to be noted. Just because everyone is equal in the body does not mean that everybody has, has um, free reign. Oh, well, the pastor's not really in control because he's not no more than a Christian than I am. Well, yes, that is true. He is no more than a Christian than you are. You are both equally saved, but he has a higher um, authority than you. God has placed him in a place of leadership. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little bit off topic, so I really don't want to go too much into that, but I, I hope you see what I'm saying. Romans uh, 15, 5-7 says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement uh, give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. So with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. Now remember, he's talking about um, the, the Christians amongst themselves, okay? Um, and I do want to clarify something. Um, you do not get the blessings of the body without being part of the body. Sometimes people who are not saved will expect the same blessings of those being saved. How come the Holy Spirit won't comfort me? Well, you know, once again, that promise was really only for the body. Um, you can't possibly um, get paid for... Let, let's say you walk into Subway, okay, and you say, I'm here for my check. And then I say, well, you don't work for us. So you're not entitled for that check, right? Because you didn't do the, you don't work there, right? It's the exact same thing. You're not entitled towards the blessings of God if you're not even part of His kingdom. So, First um, Corinthians three, um, sixteen through seventeen. Says, do you know? Don't you know? Sorry, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. When we choose, okay, when we choose sin, we allow sin amongst our midst, what happens is God rejects our pride. See, what we do is we, we accept bad things out of the pride and pride in our heart, and God opposes us. And he actually literally comes against us, and, 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 and remember, the prideful person is broken and soon without repair, okay? Um, and, 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 and so when that happens, it's important to note that we are um, rejecting rejecting God there. Um, okay, so Galatians, I think I kind of 
said all I wanted to say there. Galatians 3, 26 um, through 28 says, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male nor and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, obviously, he's not saying that we are all unisex. That's not what, he, what he's saying. Um, he's saying that we have been made, we are all equally saved, okay? Um, so, obviously, I find great fault in, in those people who say things like, you know, um, the man is, is the one who's saved and he has to impart grace to the wife and that kind of stuff. It's just stupid. Um, go, um, that was Galatians, Philippians 2, 1 through 5. Um, and I am reading from the NIV. Um, in 2011, they did, they did a, a, a new version of the NIV. It is, it is wonderful. It is wonderful. I strongly encourage it. It's very easy to understand. Um, but it, it, it clarifies a lot of the things that the 80, and that the version from the 80s just left so obscure. Um, and, and obviously it's, it's a huge step up from the TNIV. Um, ju uh, just, just a great, um, a, a great resource. Um, I highly encourage you to check it out. Um, Philippians 2, 1 through 5. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being um, united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and, and of one mind. Um, verse 3 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interests of the others. Okay? Uh, in your relationship, relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Wow, that is a, that is a mouthful of things. Um, but if you break them apart, you really start to see what the body is. And obviously, I'll talk about this later, but um, there is, for those uh, people who try to say stuff like, oh, I don't need to go to the, the actual church service, I can have church in my home. This does not work because you will become blinded towards the things that, that you are okay with. And because you've separated yourself from the church, you, nobody's going to be there to tell you this. Also, House churches like that traditionally do not do much in way of uh, ministry. They usually have the same two or three people there every single week. They don't really do anything. They just encourage themselves in themselves and kind of stray away from God's word. They usually don't have good doctrine, um, you know. And eventually, even something that started out good um, just kind of falls apart because there's no authority structure. The things need authority structure. The government needs authority structure. Uh, the church needs authority structure. Your family, your your household needs authority structure. When things don't have an authority structure, it, it just kind of goes wherever. Look at the book of Judges. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Things need that structure. Regardless of how you understand the structure, they still need that structure. Okay? So, um, Okay, so um, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Everything you do is a church function. Okay, um, so if you are saved, you reflect God to the world. This is important because sometimes we separate ourselves from um, from God's um, God's activity. Okay, we go somewhere and we just kind of take off the Christian hat because it's not convenient. Okay, and this is a huge mistake. A huge mistake. What we're showing to the world is a partial Christ, not a Christ that rules over all of our being. Okay. Um, so when we get the idea that everything we do is a church function, everything we do represents God, it, it, it changes how we see things. Okay. Um, now about there's a lot of confusion in this in my town. I don't know if there is in your town, but but in my town there is. Um, we don't celebrate Jewish festivals since Christ fulfilled the law. Okay. Um, this this is really surprising to a lot of people. You know, in, in my in my town, um, there's a lot of people who celebrate um, the Passover. Well, the Passover looked forward to Christ, and we celebrate the Lord's Supper as looking back to Christ. If you're still celebrating the Passover, you're rejecting Christ. 
Does that make sense? You're you're saying that you're still looking for a Messiah when he already came. Okay? So so I think that that really is, is important. Know why they are celebrated. Okay? Know why they are celebrated among the Jews, and then that would help you understand whether there's any harm in celebrating it. Um, I would personally say that the, the, that the Passover is something that we absolutely cannot celebrate as Christians. Um, and, and there are a few other ones, but I think that, I think that and I mentioned this in the Old Testament class, um, so if you're interested, go watch that. But it is extremely essential that we do not celebrate uh, those things that, 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 that Jesus fulfilled. Okay? Um, the things that we are absolutely called to to, to celebrate, and in and, and, and Colossians, Paul writes about this. He says, don't let somebody persuade you by these festivals. In the same way, don't be persuaded by these by these festivals. Um, the only things that we're, that we're told to do is, is water baptism and um, the Lord's Supper or Communion. Um, all those different things that... Um, the Jews were getting them, themselves upset about. Paul didn't even really address most of them. With you know, with he addressed the eating the meat that was offered to God. So he addressed that with the he, he did address that, um, but he didn't address you know all the different uh, festivals. He, he, he nowhere in the New Testament are we told you know that we have to do these things. And obviously, the person who's for these 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 different festivals would say, well, Jesus celebrated them. Yes, because Jesus was Jewish, and Jesus was um, was operating in the time before the church was started. I already kind of mentioned this earlier. Um, he didn't do those things. If you look at Jesus' ministry, he didn't even go to the Gentiles. Why? Because that was the job of the church. And when he left this earth in the ascension, he said, "Okay, now go to the ends of the earth. Now go." But there was there was that there was that process that he took. And while Jesus was here, he did live under the constraints of the Jewishness. Okay, so I think that that does need to be noted. Um, obviously, that would have a lot of a lot of bearing to do with a lot of different things um, with that Jesus did. And you know, the thing about the gospel is sometimes it accurately recur records things that we are not necessarily meant to still do. Now, I don't want to get too much off topic, and I don't want people to think that I'm saying that the Gospels are not for us today. The Gospels are for us today. We just have to understand them in their light. Okay? So, um, obviously, like, for instance, the Pharisees. We don't have Pharisees today. Well, I mean, we have, um, we have people in the church who are very legalistic, but even then, there's 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 not an, an overlap because the Pharisees had good intentions. They wanted to maintain God's laws in every circumstance. The Pharisees that we that we call Pharisees today just want everybody to become Jewish. They want everybody to follow Leviticus. Well, I just hope you see what I'm saying. Um, so uh, beware of complaining in church. Complaining really is a virus, and you know you you think that you're making yourself feel better. But actually, you're making yourself feel worse. When you complain, you just feel dirty. You just feel like you need a shower, but like inside. You, you, you all, you've spent the past hour and a half talking about all how everybody else is doing wrong. And, and you start to understand yourself in a more critical light. Sometimes when people complain, it actually comes from a place within themselves of having a very negative spirit. Okay? Now, I'm not talking about spirit is in demon possession or, 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 or demonic influence and that's not necessarily what I'm saying when Paul wrote the Corinthian church he didn't say um, you cast out these demons that are causing um, uh, disunity among you he said you stop causing disunity you need to do this so in the same way I'm not casting blame on demons in fact if you read the book of James he says you can't blame God and you can't blame, blame the devil because you could resist him he says you only have yourselves to blame so I think that that's kind of kind of Important to note. But anyways, um, um, when you when you complain, is often because you, you are very negative. Now, g causes for negativity can be looking at porn is a big one. Um, um, not seeking after the Lord is a big one. Uh, not spending adequate time in prayer or, or, or that kind of thing is a big one. Um, 
Uh, sometimes burnout, uh, if you've worn yourself too thin, sometimes that can make you feel very negative. But anyways, this negativity kind of creeps in and it, help, and it helps you to see all the faults in yourself and all the faults in everyone else. And so then negative people be, do negative things and they will complain. It's like uh, a counselor once told me, hurt people hurt people. Hurt people, someone who's hurt, hurt other people. That, that's what they do. Um, so Satan causes outward focuses to be inward focuses. What happens to a church that's stagnating, that's becoming dead? They start focusing, they start arguing about pews. They start arguing about what they should wear to church and what other people should wear to the church. They start arguing about this and that and the other thing, and they lose the focus of the church. It's no longer, we are no longer God's temple. We're no longer trying to save our community. We don't even care if new people come in because new people cause problems. We don't want a bigger church. We want to just live. We don't want news people because they're not going to be disciplined. Their kids are going to write on our bathroom walls. They're going to come and they're just going to they're going to mess everything up. They're not going to have decorum. They're they're going to when we're praying, they're going to be talking and they're going to cause a, a ruffle in our feathers and they're just going to mess things up. Yeah, they probably will because the people in America are not so much coming back to Jesus anymore. They're people who have never known Jesus. They simply think that he's another religion. And with the relativism in our society, oh, everything's right as long as it's right in my own eyes, it's, it's even more important that we establish ourselves as Christ's body. Okay, It's not good enough to play church anymore. It's just not good enough. Um, and so Satan will always cause those things that are not even issues to become issues. You know, the, the, the building project. Remember, the building project is just there for you to allow more people in at one time. That's the only reason for a bigger building. It's not to have nicer tile. It's not to have nicer walls. It's not to have the perfect bathrooms. Those things do cause a good first impression. But there's more important things than arguing about budget, than arguing about the seating, than arguing about the music. Our mission is to become relevant in such a way that we are that we are staying faithful to the Christian message, but making it real in people's lives. People don't just need abstract knowledge thrown at them. They need something that applies to them. So inward focus destroys the direction and the purpose of the church. When we become too much focused with, with, with maintenance, maintaining things, we become very selfish and prideful. And that helps us to not see God's purpose for the community, for us, for the way we could grow and adapt. You know, in Christ's body, there is no one who does not fit. There's just people who are unique and different from everyone else. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. What we do is we say, oh, this person is very um, confrontational. So they're not welcome here. Maybe they're undisciplined in their root character, and maybe they, they, they have some bad things that need to be rooted out. They're a human, just like you are. They probably do have mistakes and sins. But what we need to do is we need to develop that character. We need to disciple that character. That's the purpose of the church, to raise those people up, to raise up future leaders. Okay, We are the church of today. The old, the young, the middle, we're all here. The men, the, men, the women, this is the church of today. Okay, And I think that's increasingly important to understand. And everyone has a purpose in God's kingdom. Complaining causes disunity, which disrupts the activity of the Holy Spirit. That's just a general principle. If you complain, don't expect to be experienced in the Holy Spirit. The move of the Holy Spirit is going to become very stagnant. Um, and, and, and here's the thing. People who complain, they will usually justify it. I'm not really complaining. Okay, here's the thing. If you are saying something about someone else, you are complaining, more than likely. That's just the general principle. Okay. So what I can never talk about someone else, usually it's a good idea to not talk about someone else. Um, now, there are exceptions. Like, for instance, I'm talking to my mom and I say, you know, my son is, is, is really wanting this job. Well, I'm not, I'm, not compla I'm not complaining or anything. I'm not gossiping. But it, this is complaining. The pastor just doesn't understand how profitable I could be to this church. He just doesn't understand that I'm not trying to, trying to overthrow his power in some power struggle. I'm just trying to get my voice heard. That's complaining. Um, complaining is nitpicking. It's, it's following after people, pointing out all the things that irritate you. 
Um, so, now that we've talked about the structure of the church, let's talk about the actual purpose. I've, I've talked about purpose is purpose that. What is the actual purpose? Well, let's talk about that. I'm glad you asked. Um, first off, living apart from the church is foreign to everything the Bible teaches. Okay, In Hebrews, he talks about continue to meet together. Um, and obviously, he's talking about a united church. He's not talking about when there's a perfectly good congregation down the street. Separating yourself because you don't like they're this, you don't like they're that. That's complaining, exactly what I just talked about. Um, you know, obviously, in, be under authority, goodness sakes, I can't say this enough. Pastors are ordained by their denomination, and that denomination has people who, who they're accountable to. And all this is under God. But when you separate yourself, you're just out there, you, you're just like a turd sitting out there on the side of the road. There, there's no purpose, you're just sitting there. Um... So, why does the body meet? The body meets to first off be under authority. It's it's a structure that's very much so needed. Um, second off, it meets to discover God's direction. You know, usually when a church is seeking after the Lord, God will guide everyone where the church is going somewhere, and the people who are involved with that are going with them. And then there's the people who are who complain and oppose the direction of the church. That once again, they're the turds on the side of the road. That somebody didn't have, you know, a bathroom to go to, so they just popped it right there on the side of the road. They just sit there in the sun, they get stagnant, and they just sit there. They, they're just waste. Because they're not being renewed in Christ. They're just a turd. They were water that used to be fresh, but then sat there for long enough and become st became stagnant. They don't know God's direction because they're opposing God's direction. They want their own way. They want a country club. They want things done their way. They want to have assigned seating. They want to have everything where, where they're in charge of it. They want to have they're, – they're not interested in God's kingdom. And this is God's kingdom, to save the lost, not to save those people who are beneficial. My pastor once said, showed us this diagram. It was a funnel. It said every time that we give a – a disclaimer to God, it narrows the funnel of who I can witness to. They have to be white. They have to be middle class. They can't be drug addicts. They can't they can't um they can't be people who've never known God. They can't be the demon possessed. They can't be people who struggle with alcohol. They can't be porn addicts. They can't be adulterers. They can't be this. They can't be child molesters. Oh no, God doesn't love child molesters. See, and we start narrowing the focus according to our own bias. The Bible says that God sent Jesus for everyone, not for some, for everyone. Okay, there's, there's, that definitely needs to be understood. God's direction. Okay, strengthen, um, the body needs to strengthen one another. We meet together, we encourage one another. We worship together. You know, I will tell you this. There are elements of God speaking to you and influencing your life that will only come through worshiping as a community. There are some things that you will never get by worshiping in your car, in your home. That's a good thing, and that devotion is good, and God will speak to you in other ways that you will never have received in that. But when we do that by itself, okay, by itself, and we don't and then also worship together, and I'm not just talking about music, um, we miss out on God's direction, and we could become stagnant. We need that group, that group interaction, okay? Especially those people who irritate you because they're going to teach you the things. You know, people never get in the way of ministry. They are ministry. Even the irritating ones that you just hate, they are your ministry. It's very important that you don't forget that. Very important. You can't pick and choose who your audience is. God, send people by. Well, here they are. What are you doing? You're waiting for this perfect person to come by, and they never do. Okay. So the body meets to prevent false teachings. Um, obviously, that's something there. Oftentimes, denominations will have uh, teachings like the, the Sims of God, for instance, has their 16 fundamental truths. Okay, that's, that's the things that they see as most important. Um, the Four Square Gospel has their four point thing. See what I mean? The four cardinal doc uh, doctrines and those kinds of things. Uh, and these are things that they that they hold to and, and the, make that denomination that denomination. Okay, obviously I'm not saying that they can't work with other denominations as long as they're of the same faith. Um, so just a quick question. I talk about this in other places. I just want to make sure we're on the same pages. Being of a different faith is teaching a different God. Okay? 
being of, uh, being of a different faith is not just teaching a different God, it's teaching a different salvation. Um, if you teach salvation by works or by any other thing other than Jesus Christ and, and Him alone, you are lying to people. If you teach that, that God is not Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, you are lying to people. 1 John 2.22 um, says, Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ, and to be the Christ, he would have to be God. We already talked about this kind of stuff. Um, such a person is the Antichrist, okay? Denying the Father and the Son. See, by denying the Son, you actually deny the Father. So Mormonism, for instance, they deny God. Jehovah's Witness, they deny God. You can't possibly be saved if you don't even know who the God is. How do they know? By hearing the word of God. So, but this isn't a class and call. So, uh, we also meet together to worship. I already mentioned that. To evangelize and to make, make disciples. Okay? Uh, as cute as it is to separate yourself from everyone else and to do things your own way, it just doesn't get the job done. Fact. So, also, the church is not just simply a place that you go to get fed. And I, will, I do have some scripture verses I want to read. I just want to finish this up. It's not just a place, excuse me, that you go to get fed, okay? Oh, well, I go to my church and it feeds me. Well, that's good, but are you having devotional life? Are you witnessing to people? You know, God will literally cause you to not be able to grow if you are not um, um, witnessing, if you are not discipling people. You will literally not grow. God will not draw you in that way because you're not obeying what he commanded you to do. That was one of the big things that he said before he left. When he was uh, the, when he was ascending, he didn't say, "Oh yeah, and uh, make sure that you have communion every single Sunday, just to stay it frequently." Um, he didn't say that. He said, "Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit." So, all right. Um, I just place you go to get fed. Okay, you are supposed to be feeding others too. You give so you can. Um, you 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 receive so you can give. Um, general calling. And these are two different ways that someone will be called. There's a general calling. This is the the call on every person to be saved and to spread the gospel. Upon your salvation, you are still you are meant to be a a testimony to Christ, a martyr, a word that means um, witness. Um, in today's connotation, it means someone who died for the gospel or for something of, of substantial value. Um, but anyway, so you get what I'm saying. The calling on every person to be saved and to spread the gospel. But then there's a special calling. And this is the call placed on some to do a specific ministry. Not everyone is called to be a pastor. Sometimes we have natural talents, okay? Um, natural skills. Um, you're good at the guitar. Um, and so it's easy and natural to assume that you would be the good, a good worship leader. Okay. Um, first off, if someone's already the worship leader, back off. Let me just start with that. If somebody's already in that role, back off. It's obviously not for you. Okay. Um, you could talk to the person, see if they needed any help with it. That that's harmless. But when you go behind their back and ask the pastor if you could uh, get in on that on their ministry, that's that's bad. Okay. And, Pastor, if you condone that, that, that's bad. You're actually causing disunity. Remember, us leaders, we set the tone for the church. If we become bitter, the church will be bitter. If we love people and continue to serve and continue to, to, to press on, they will do that. We set the tone in our household, in our church. Leaders do that. Leaders don't constantly blame everyone else for what's going on. They take action. I do hope you understand what I'm saying there. So don't confuse a calling for a talent or a skill. Um, I know one woman came into our church and, oh, you should put me up there on that worship team. Oh, shoot, I can get that job done. And then the next week she was in jail. Well, see what I mean? Obviously, I had the discretion not to put her on the worship team. But surely, you, and, and, and actually, I will go, on, I'll go further. The senior pastor supported me in the fact that I wasn't there for that Sunday and he didn't make the decision without me because he put me in the place of being over that. See what I mean? When you have there's that structure there. If you have an associate pastor, trust them to do the job that you hired them for. Don't hold so tight onto your reins that you can't see past your own fingertips. 
Some churches have this idea that the senior pastor has to dictate everything. He has to dictate when you can move, how much food you can eat. I mean, he dictates everything. This is not good. This is, once again, an imbalance. It's going too far to the other extreme. Instead of having no structure, it has too much structure. Sometimes people have co have committees, and they have committees for the committees, and they have all these meetings, and they have so much structure that is killing the life of the church. This is not good either. Sometimes we think that, that having the purpose, uh, the perfect purpose statement and goals and mission statement and those kinds of things, that that makes the perfect church. Well, no, those simply help you to, to do the thing that you're that you're that you're there for. Okay, I tell you that. Let me tell you this right off. We don't have a real fancy missions or purpose statement, and we don't hammer it into our church all the time. In fact, I'm pretty sure if you ask people, what's our mission or purpose, and they'll they'll say, I have no idea what our official statement is, but they know what we're here for. We're saving people, okay, and we're teaching people. That's what we're here for. We're here to love people and to bring them into into fellowship with God's kingdom. They'll know that. They won't know some fancy statement. But that's because we've tried to once again say that this structure is good for every church. We don't we we do it in our mega church and we all the smaller churches should do it too. Think outside the box by doing exactly the same thing that we do. No, this is not good. You follow God's leading, and if it so happens that creating a purpose statement and a mission statement help with that, well, good for you. But it doesn't necessarily apply to every church. What you have is you have these young pastors who know everything. They, they're completely oblivious to all the conflict they're going to face. They're completely oblivious to the problems in ministry that they're going to face, but they still have all the answers. And so they get into church and they try to change everything at once. Well, this is going to the other extreme. So, willing back into my main 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 point here, know the difference between a calling and a passion or a talent. Okay. Um, oftentimes, it doesn't necessarily need to be mystical. Let me move this out of the way. Um, we're told, for instance, to care that true religion is caring for the widows and orphans, uh, making time to bless others. You see, you see a homeless person, so you give them money. Or if you looks like they look like an alcoholic, give you give them food or their clothing or that kind of thing. You give them the things that are necessary because you have that ability to give. You're making time to bless. Okay. Uh, there's someone that just came to the church. They feel out, out out of place, and so you make the time to go over there and just have a dinner with them, or invite them over to your house. Fellowship with each other. This is a good thing. Um, you know, if someone's moving, and, and even though they're not part of the, part of the Christian church, you, you you go over there and 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 you help them to move. You take the time to walk the neighborhood and pick up trash. These are things that it doesn't have to be real mystical, some light from above. Sometimes that does happen, but don't expect it for every single time you do a ministry. Um, explore scripture and see what God says that we need to be doing. Um, okay, so just a, a few more quick words here about this, and then I'll read the scriptures, and this is where this is going to stop. Next lesson, we'll talk about the ordinances, or you might call them sacraments. I'll explain the difference between what those are. Um, and you know, the, the problem, I just mentioned this again, the problem with works by faith is that you always have to do one more work. How many works do you have to do to be saved? Always one more. Um, okay. Um, about, about this. A talent is something you naturally have, but sometimes you won't naturally have a talent, and this Holy Spirit will gift you in an area, okay? I hate public speaking. I hate it. I'm an introvert. I'd much rather spend all my time at my house writing blogs. I'd much rather do that. But that's not what God called me to do. And so he empowers me for what he called me to do. I naturally am talented with the guitar. Okay. However, I was not talented with singing, and I was not definitely not talented with leading worship. But God empowered me for something that he called me to. Okay. God will give you the ability to whatever he calls you to. All right. Um, don't expect that God will call you to go to Bible college if he doesn't make a way financially. I'm sure you understand what I'm saying here. But there is definitely a difference. And what we try to do is we in mega churches nowadays is we try to substitute substitute the Holy Spirit moving for natural talent. And we try to say that there is no difference. This is a bad thing. And then what sometimes in smaller churches do is because they don't have the ability to 
have a bunch of big fancy ministries because they're too small. They try to substitute having a direction with just being good people. Or, you know, not really theology, but just folk theology. Where it, it really has no basis, but it just they're nice people. And, and, and they sometimes just, you know, well, we're seeking after the Holy Spirit, but we have no direction. Well, that's not good either. It's like I deal with a lot of people who go through burnout and passionlessness and, and those kinds of things. Um, and then they, they seek after move of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's good. It's good to expect renewal with the Holy Spirit. You know, seek after him. Good, 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 good. But if you're still doing the same dumb things, you're going to get the same result. The Holy Spirit can move on you all he wants, all you want even. But if you continue to do the same dumb things over and over again, it's not going to matter. The very next day, you're going to be right back in the same place. Does that make sense? See, what we do is we send our kids, for instance, to youth camp, and they get all on fire, and then they come back to the same environment, and we don't do anything to nurture that. And the youth camp built up the passion. They didn't necessarily teach the skills to keep the passion. So then we don't give them the skills that they need to maintain that passion, and we're so dead ourselves that we can't give it to them. So it doesn't matter that the Holy Spirit moved on them, and they're dead in another two weeks. See what I'm saying? You can't substitute special calling for talent. Okay, you can do a ministry and you can do it well and not be led by the Spirit, not be anointed by the Spirit. I've heard a lot of good singers lead worship, but I've had, I've heard very few worship leaders be led by the Holy Spirit. And that is unique. Okay, skill does not make somebody right for a job. Never forget that. Skill never makes someone right for a job. Anointing does. What makes you successful at the end of the day is how much or how little the Holy Spirit was able to use you. Not, and I mean um, work through you and do those kinds of things, not how perfect your hair was, how, how perfect your message was. At the end of the day, that's what's going to matter. Success is being led by the Holy Spirit, and never forget that. Because in your ministry, you will fail. You will fail. You will go through times of being dry. You will face times that it seems like you're doing nothing but conflict after conflict. That's going to happen. Count on it. Eventually. And also count on this. You will reach your prime in ministry after you've been at that place for seven years. For seven years is, after, is when you'll finally reach your prime. Everything you do in the first seven years will will pale in comparison. So what we try to do is we go to, try to go to a place and then you know we set things in order or whatever or things get worse and so we leave. No, you gotta ride the storm. If you've been called to a place, ride the storm. You cannot possibly expect to to for things to go well after only being there a year or two, especially if the church is a problem church. And what I mean by problem church is that it has had a lot of problems. Um, oh so many things that I could say about ministry. So many things. Um Ugh. But I will say this, there will come a time when you've been in, in the ministry for about four or five years and you will feel the burning passion, passion to, to go somewhere else. You're called to go somewhere else. Ignore it. Usually, most of the time, it is just a feeling. It's something that we all get in ministry. It's that, that passion to do more, to go elsewhere. Use it to drive you to more prayer, to drive you to more activity where you are. Okay? Um... Matthew 28, and this is where we'll stop. We're just going to read a few uh, scripture references. Matthew 28, um, 19 through 20 says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to, um, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Um, now, obviously, this doesn't mean like the Jehovah's Witness would claim that there will not be a actual um, return by Jesus, as Thessalonians clearly uh, or clears out uh, says that the things that have to happen before, and the things that have to happen uh, that 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 that, ha that will for certain happen, and those kinds of things. Um, First and Second Thessalonians, Craig Blomberg once said that the themes of First and Second Thessalonians could be said like this: First Thessalonians says. Um, Jesus is coming soon, and then Second Thessalonians says, "But not that soon." <laughs> uh, 
uh, just great that Jesus has not come yet, but that he is still coming very soon. Uh, anyways, I'm, I'm getting off topic again. Uh, Matthew 28, oh, so, so 1 Corinthians 12. And you know, for, in, in, the, in the church of Corinth, they were really abusing the gifts of the Spirit. You know that? And yet Paul never once says not to seek the gifts of the Spirit. He just says to do it in an orderly fashion. I know a lot of times we've known people who are bitter, nasty people. Uh, Scott Wilson, actually, I, I heard talk about this. Um, you know, bitter, nasty people, and then, and then they're using the gifts. And so I think that, that justifies their, their just nastiness. And so what we do is we get turned off by the Holy Spirit. Um, I had a professor once who, who said this. We either become apathetic towards the Spirit. We just don't care one way or another what he does. We become fearful of the, uh, of the Holy Spirit. Um, where, you know, where, I don't want that to happen either because we're afraid, afraid of the effects or we just have dealt with the weird a little bit too long. Or we become over-focused on the Spirit where, you know, I was laughing in the Spirit. Blah, 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 you know, all these weird things. And it's just, uh, there is a balance, and, and Paul writes in, in Corinthians uh, about that balance. 1 Corinthians 12, 14 through 31, which I'm not going to read. Um, and obviously, well, I'm in Romans, huh? Um, 12, 14 through 31, um, talks about this structure. I'm not going to read all of it, but even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say this, and he goes on with that, and then he says in 21, The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body don't seem to be weaker. Um, and I do want to say this. Um, if someone's used in the, Holy, in, the, in the Holy Spirit, or they're filled with the Holy Spirit, that doesn't make them a second class, a, a higher class of a Christian. That just means that they're driving the Christian walk in a Lexus rather than a Yugo. Okay, does that make sense? That just means that you're driving in a nice ride, and rather than, than the, all the Holy Spirit doesn't make, it doesn't give you more. He doesn't give you a sink in salvation. He doesn't fully save you, or it, that that's not what the Holy Spirit does. He, when you are saved, every Christian has a measure of the Holy Spirit, and this is what causes you to to your conscience to be healed over time. You to gradually change. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and then when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, it just helps you to live more abundantly on earth. Okay, so, um, and and you can read through there, but he says about the different things that um, do all speak in tongues, do all have gifts of healings, are all teachers. You know, everybody has their 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 thing, and we're not all expected to do the same thing. You know, do you want to say one other thing? We are never called to be robots. I, I know a lot of people have a problem with this. Oh, Christians, they just think that everybody should be a robot. No, not at all. We're just called to live a life of love rather than a love of a life of love for ourselves. Does that make sense? Rather than loving ourselves, everyone in the world, what they do is they love themselves. They may justify themselves with, "Oh no, I'm a good person. I do a lot of good things. I do charity. I do this and that." Um, but it's all deep down inside. It's out of love for self. Okay. When John John put it like and puts it like this: You can't possibly have the love have the love of God if you don't if you don't know God. And that that is a sign of, of of having God. And someone cannot possibly say, you know, I hate my brother and I love God at the same time. The Holy Spirit will convict you and He will He will change that in you. Obviously, some things are gradual processes, but you get what I'm saying. Hebrews ten. 24 through 25, a greatly misunderstood book. Um, um, and let us consider um, and let us cons uh, ooh, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning, after we have received the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. Uh, I'll go ahead and stop there. Um, James 5.14 and 16. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Regardless of what you understand this passage to mean, it is very important that he did establish that structure there. And in 16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is a 
is powerful and effective. Okay. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5.13 First Thessalonians uh, five thirteen B through twenty two. I'm not gonna read all this either. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other and love because of their work. Live in peace. I'm sorry. Uh, and we urge you. Sorry, I knew that sounded wrong. wrong. Um, let me start again because I messed up there. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong. Also, don't pay back wrong for good. Sometimes people do you good. And I'll give you an example. Your wife... Um, I heard I read this in the book somewhere. Um, your wife fills up your gas for you, and and you you're, you're in a rush for work. You rush out the door, and your car's not there. Uh, my wife greatly she just totally uh, messed up my schedule. She was trying to do something good. You see what I mean? Don't repay evil for good. When somebody is trying to do something right, you don't you don't do something bad. Like let's say you have a teenage daughter, and she wears a dress, but she doesn't know that not to cross her legs, for instance. So then you hop on her, oh, do, 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 do. rather than simply, you know, saying, well, hey, you know, we can kind of see your tush. You, you see what I'm saying? She did something good. She wore a dress and she was trying to present herself well. And so you hopped on her for the thing that she messed up for rather than the things she did good on. It's the exact same thing with kids and, and with all kinds of different, different situations. Don't overlook the good inside of the bad. Um, so repay good for good. Repay um, evil with good, okay? Um, if you only love those who love you, you're not the church anymore. You're just simply a country club. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong for anyone, for all, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Always strive to do what is good for each other and everyone else. And he goes on saying more stuff. It's just a great passage. I encourage you to read it through to 22. Um, and I will say something real quick. You know, sometimes people say, um, actually, I, I'm, I'm going to wait for that for another lesson. Um, I'm just taking too long on this one. Micah 6, 8, um, about um, general calling says, you know, help us to, uh, I can't remember it all right now, but help us to love mercy and to do justly. Um, I mean, actually, let me just find it. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly. To act justly. Okay. That's how we act. To love mercy. That's the attitude that we do it in. Okay? And to walk humbly with your God. That prevents you from lifting yourself up in pride against someone else. So, um, everyone has, has, has that general ministry. But in Exodus 35, 30 through 35, it talks about um, Bezalel and Aholiab. Two people that God specifically called specifically called out for a purpose, um, and obviously Moses was called to lead the lead the nation, not anyone else. Aaron was called to be the priest. I mean, you could you could keep going on, on these different things. There's just so many different examples of sp special calling where it wasn't someone else's job. And I will say this: sometimes people say something along the lines of this. You know, the pastor says this, but I just don't feel like the church should be going in that direction. Well, it's not your job to feel where the church is going. It's your job to follow. It's the pastor's job to do that. Just like it was Moses who received the law, not everyone else. It wasn't Korah who received the law, was it? So, 15.22, plan, and also I will say this. You know, in, in Joshua, Achan takes that thing from the city, and, and, and as a result, him and his whole family die. Sometimes in, we can lose sight of things, and we actually take the place of God, especially with our kids. And, and we try to, to do things that we think are good or that are profitable for us, but what we're doing is we're stealing, we're stealing um, God's chance to work in a situation. 15.22, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. Plans fail. For lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. I should go. I feel like I should go off and start this orphanage. Maybe. Calm down there. Calm your jets. 
first off, the thing in James is talking about the poor, the forgotten, the needy. Those are the people that we're, that we're called to, not necessarily and only widows and orphans, okay? It may include those, but there are also others that it may include. Um, so uh, whenever you're, you're, you have, you feel like you have a special calling, run up by the pastor. See what he has to say about it. Maybe he, you know, I'll tell you, give you an example of both. Um, I got on my fight on my about my you know five year mark where I um, was getting very antsy to go somewhere else and and, and, and I felt like I should start a, start a, a church somewhere and I I still have the place in my heart and, and maybe someday I'll I'll end up going there. Um, I do pray for them now just in case I ever get there and if I don't get there you know hey I'm sure God will um, call someone. Um, I will say this: don't always bank on God calling someone else. Okay. Um, I know sometimes uh, we say from the book of Esther that, that God will call someone else sometimes. God will use someone else, but sometimes he won't. Um, and sometimes he gives you second chances on stuff, and sometimes he doesn't. Um, so about, um, I'm, I got a little bit off track there, but some, uh, about the, I'm, this lesson is really going long. It's been about an hour or um, about the about the plans. Okay, so I got I got near that five year mark and and I was doing um, just really feeling antsy and I went to the pastor and I told him what, what my thoughts were and he said you know this is this is just not right I, I this is just this just isn't right. I talked to my wife about it. She said well I don't necessarily feel like um, like this is this is right for right now. I feel like we're we're, we're we are where we are supposed to be. So I mean who are the authorities in my in my life? My wife, my pastor. So I asked them, and my pastor is also my boss. Um, so I killed uh, two birds with one stone there. Um, so I asked those people, and they were able to give me insight because I allowed the counsel of others. Um, and so then I asked people, other people, different things that I could that I could help in and, and, and further ministry and do do more in. And now we're starting a rec center and a, t and a rec and tutoring center um, for the youth in our area. See. Um, use it for the benefit benefit of God's kingdom, um, and a, an example of, of, of the opposite of that um, is there was a, a woman. All right, let me let me start from the beginning. My, our pastor wanted to start this prayer time on Tuesdays, but he didn't want to be the one to start it. He wanted God to send someone to start it. Uh, I could get more into why, but that's really not important for the sake of the story. Um, so, anyways, this woman came to came to pastor and she said. I think we should start start a start a prayer time on this time on this day. Exactly what the what the pastor um, had said, and that the, in his heart that he that he wanted to do in in prayer, um, and so he was able to say yes, go and do that because he waited for God to do something. See what I mean? And 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 so she stepped out and was and talked to the pastor, and, and God used her. Does that make sense? So once again, Proverbs 15:22, plans fell for lack of counsel. But with many advisors to succeed. If you're a pastor and you're just going from town to town to town to town, small church to small church, first off, think long run here. You will have no retirement. And I know that doesn't seem like a big deal now, but when you start to get in your 50s and 60s and you have nothing to live on, you have no house, you have no money set aside, you have nothing, and you spend a large majority of your time fighting to make men's eat, uh, ends meet week by week, this is going to be a problem. Okay? Don't expect – this is what people do. God will provide. Well, God's given you the tools to plan ahead. Obviously, we shouldn't plan too far ahead and store up wealth for ourselves here on earth. That's not what I'm saying. But once again, balance. Balance. Um, and once again, I can't really get onto that. There's so many things I want to say, just not enough time to do it. Um, uh, so many things I want to say. Um James one twenty seven. I hope this has helped you understand what the church is, is is about and what it's supposed to be and whatnot and what you can do to stop expecting entertainment. James one twenty seven says, um, "Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this: to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world." Once again, it's impossible to say that you are of the body and still act like the world. Give it time, though. Um, as you grow, you will change. Um, so, 
Um, I believe that's everything I wanted to say. Did I have room to say?